welcome everyone, uh, Corvin, Daniel, Jan, and Andrew. Uh, Jan just described the situation relating to vert IO SCSI and CTL behavior where tags are being truncated and are perhaps not. Jan, is it safe to say incremented uh, well, or what's your best way to describe what the I existing do, code is doing wrong? The existing code is using a pointer to a struct as a tag for SCSI commands. And the pointer is truncated to a 32 bit integer in the CTL layer, where it's no longer unique and can collide with other pointers with the same lower half, which then would be expected to be detected by the CTL layer and refused. It will then be re. Uh, queued with a new struct and next time it probably doesn't collide. So we can't produce data corruption like that, but it does produce a very noisy error. Is, could the, a different, could that number be uh, rearranged so that either, so the upper half is read by CTL, the CTL uh, layer? That I try sawing the two parts of the pointer together just to change the collision probability. Okay. So XOR of upper half of pointer and lower half of pointer. Uh, that was, didn't have the expected Im impact either. So I'm no longer 100% convinced that we have found all the problems, but it could also be some other reason. Another probability, uh, possibility would be to make sure that we pre-allocate the pointers from an array uh, somewhere just for testing purposes, maybe 10,000 or so, and do it like that. There are lots of options here. Got it, okay. To oh. narrow this down, but I'm, yeah, right now I don't trust myself to do it. <laughs> okay. Uh Corvin, did I read you mentioning uh, in the commits Mac OS support? I have never tried it, but um, what I did is that, um, so I've noticed that um, Linux uh, sends some strange uh, IPs uh, if the APIC version is lower than uh, Null x uh, 14 and um, and then I've googled a bit and found that uh, it looks like macOS panics if the epic ID is lower than this value. So um, if we want to uh, support macOS in the future sometime, I think this would be necessary. Um, but the patch is already included in uh, current. Got it. So, uh, do you have any macOS experience? No. Okay, I do, and I do have a, a personal interest in virtualizing macOS, as my workhorse OSs are obsoleted by Apple <laughs> and the software I run on them. So I'm more than happy to test that, as I, I genuinely care, and I'm happy to throw various versions at it. Uh, do you think there are more missing components or it's as simple as that, the APIC ID being in the right scope? Well, I've never tested it. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, I don't Love it. know. Thank you. Do you have other news regarding your work that you'd like to share with the group? Um, I have... Um... Uh, so I split uh, off the female config requirements from my ACPI table um, patch. So um, I reworked it and now uh, it doesn't require us female config anymore. So um, female, using female config would have some uh, more benefits, but um, yeah, with this patch, uh, the ACPI tables are 
uh, could, could be loaded dynamically, so the offset isn't fixed. Um, and I think this will make um, yeah, future development easier. For example, I have a TPM patch, so this uh, patch isn't um, upstream yet, but I'm going to prepare it for upstreaming. Um, Is that for pass through or virtualized or something else entirely? So some time ago, I've uh, posted a patch for TPM pass through, mm -hmm. uh, but in the meantime, I've looked at QEMO and how they do it. And I decided to do it the same way like QEMO. Uh, before that, I've looked into, so my first patch uh, was similar to the Akron hypervisor, which was kind of a real pass through. Um, but I like the idea of um, QEMO because in QEMO, um, Behive emulates an interface and then uses the um, FreeBSD driver to access the host device. So uh, FreeBSD don't have to detect which physical device is present and so on. This is all done by the uh, FreeBSD driver. And uh, we have only has to care of the emulation. Uh, but this um, patch isn't uh, online anywhere yet, okay. but I'm going to do that. And for this patch, um, so if you're using a TPM device, you have to provide a TPM ACPI table. And if you um, have dynamic offsets for the ACPI table, this would be easier. And there, I will post this patch in the chat for a moment. Okay. Does this obsolete your pass-through patch or could they both be valid approaches for different use cases? Go ahead and look that up. So the ACPI table patch is, um, has nothing to do with the TPM uh, patch. Well, you mentioned a pass-through <laughs> patch that followed the ACORN approach. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Akron has a TPM pass through, um, so, and it's kind of a real pass through because you map the physical address of the TPM into the guest address space, so the guest has direct access to the device. But I don't like it because you have to um, manage very so every special case. So if you uh, have a TPM with a uh, comment response buffer interface, you have to um, pass all uh, memory regions for the comment response buffer to the guest. And if you have a uh, TPM with an FIFO interface, you have to um, handle it differently and so on. And this makes things complicated. And uh, yeah, so I don't like this approach. Okay, understood. And yeah, Acorn, I believe, is not focusing on multiple guests at one time, but I could be wrong. Anyhow. Yeah, and the QEMO approach is easier to adopt if you like to use a software TPM. Um, because all you have to change is just um, instead of accessing the host TPM driver, uh, so the FreeBSD TPM driver, uh, you can just um, access the software TPM device. Got it. Oh yeah, post something if you have it. If not, keep hacking away and you have our support. Did I understand correctly? The, ahead, the uh, one hypervisor does it by truly passing it through and the other does uh, device emulation lo looking kind of like pass through and then map the operation to a back end, which can be the host driver for the TPM? Uh, yes, so the Akron hypervisor really um, maps the physical addresses into the guest and QEMU um, emulates an interface and then um, uses the dev TPM null device uh, the... to access the physical TPM. So. But... 
that implies a lot more complexity in the hypervisor because you have to map the operations and not just pass through. No, this QEmul is the easier one because uh, you just emulate one fixed interface, um, pass the comments you get from the guest, and just write the comments to the dev TPM null device. And uh, yeah, and the Akron approach with where you map the physical address into the guest address. So you have to identify the physical address spaces and so on and create uh, proper ACPI tables and so on. So you have to handle many interfaces instead of just run. Does that answer your question, Jan? And Corbin, have you directly notified John of your updated review or split review? I've included John as a reviewer. Um, um, I, I trust he's included in the Beehive group, but um, yeah, I don't, I see. Oh, JHB, uh, I'm seeing it at the very top there. Thank you, great. I, I certainly hope he'll have a free interrupt for that. Um, anything else to report? Not from my side. Awesome, thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Um, before Daniel starts, I'll just throw out two little things. Uh, one, uh, my top priority one, as I have interrupts, will be to I reproduce the ZFS native encryption send bug or bugs. And early this morning, I found that uh, I've been traditionally doing a PCI device and just incrementing zero through seven to add hard drives, but that stopped working at about 18 disks. And so I found I had to use this syntax I've posted on the doc and I'll put in the chat, which was right out of the manual page and I had never used. I didn't have time to look at what that appears to be like in the system, be it uh, a whole one a HCI device with a miracle number of disks, but it worked. So I'm happy and I have a system in the Middle East running ZFS recovery software. So I will keep you all posted on that. And uh, Daniel, would or any questions relating to that for what it's worth? It's just me being noisy. If not, Daniel, uh, let her rip and tell us about NetGraph, buddy. Yeah, sure. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes, sir. And do you want to share your screen or just do yeah, you want to share sure. it? Okay, I will. No, that's good. Sharing. All right. Okay. So, yeah. So, so the problem basically that I'm trying to constantly solve is I I mix a lot of jails and um, Beehive VMs, and I saw that uh, VM Beehive, which is which I like a lot because it's it's basically really clean and you can sort of put it wherever you want. Um, does some switch management, but that switch management, you know, it's it's a little it's a little noisy. It doesn't work with NetGraph, and um, you know you can sort of force your jail.conf stuff into it, but um, I don't know. I, I I just have always been looking for a way to better manage my jails, and doing that with with Bridge IF Bridge. Um, e pair um, and and tap is as it it just gets it just gets messy. I don't know if I have any servers I can show you right now, but you know I have some servers with you know oh god uh, we're sorry about the banging um, with hunt with dozens many dozens of e pair devices. So netgraph just makes it a little more civilized. So here I have a system, and I'll show you a, a relatively complex setup, and then I'll show you sort of the defaults and how, how easy it is to, to set up. Um, but yeah, I just have my uh, VLAN and, um, and I have my, uh, my interface. So this is an interface with VLAN. That's, those are the only two NetGraph uh, nodes that I have. These other ones are Bluetooth. Um, this is an old Mac mini. Uh, so those show up and I'm just filtering those out in the graph. Um, and then, uh, let's see. So in my jail and in my VM 
directories, I just have uh, basic little templates. I have a Debian 11 template here and a simple jail template that uses DHCP here. And then I have my system set up for that. And I have no other configurations. So um, yeah, and then, and then just a very simple jail skeleton. So of course I'll focus more on the, um, on the beehive part of this, but uh, it's just a really very simple jail skeleton and I only have to change one line to, uh, to clone it. So nothing up my sleeves and I'm going to run my little demo which is gonna create a really, really simple, um, just these four lines here or five lines here, uh, generate a net graph um, bridge. Two of these bridges go to real interfaces. This one's you know, the default interface. This one's the VLAN. And then these two, uh, we're, we're creating a private network, which um, I called Pry2 and Pry3, that's the bridge name. And then it's generating an EI face device, inner two and in, inner three, which it needs for uh, for like routing. So this is where you would run your DHCP server or something like that. And then what we have in about eleven seconds is we have eight eight uh, jails um, in these four different segmented networks, and then eight Beehive VMs all running, happy with IP addresses. And an extremely civilized uh, net graph um, graph, where we can see very clearly how everything's connected. So here are four interfaces. And you see now this is something that I would, I would uh, wanna reach out to the VM Beehive developers about that it would be really nice if VM Beehive named these nodes, but you see my jails, we created those nodes and they're, they're named and everything's linked. And here are you know, our private interfaces and here's our um, public public meaning linked to an actual interface. That, that language is taken out of VM Beehive. So that's all there is to it. So I'll show you what the, whoops, I can delete that guy. Um, so I'll show you my RC conf. So here's those lines. And then the jails need an EI face for uh, their VNet interface. So we, we create those with just the, um, ng up underscore the name of the bridge underscore list all that's all that's described in the in the readme and the repository um so yeah so th this is this this makes it comfortable and it also does i also have it uh set up to do a little bit of work on the fly so i have a mostly blank server that i set up here where i can i can show you how it's uh how, how it's set up Yeah, so pretty much nothing in the jail configuration, I'm sorry, the VM Beehive configuration here. And I would just do service ng up enable, and it'll detect that it hasn't been run before and it'll take a guess for us. Um, so using Jan's recommendation, I check the routing table and see that the default route actually goes through my VLAN. So we're gonna create a public bridge for NetGraph on our VLAN, and then we're going to create, or we by default just create an extra private one because I think, uh, you know, I think a very typical, um, uh, you know, setup is just like uh, VMware, where there's a bridged option and there's a NAT option. So we can use our private, our created EI face, which is ng host zero just by default, and of course we can change those names. Uh, any way we want over here. And if we change them, we would just have to do service ng up restart and it would regenerate all of these uh, all of these net graph nodes. Oh, of course I would have needed ng up start uh, to do it the first time, but restart works fine as well. That just clears out all of the net graph nodes and creates them again. And then I added another option called ng up VM conf. Oh no, I have to actually configure um, VM Beehive first. Let me do that quickly. 
All right, there we go. So now our VM Beehive is aware of these um, of these netgraph interfaces. Um, so now when we generate a, um, a Beehive VM here on this squeaky clean or relatively squeaky clean uh, machine, um, it would be bound to either the private or the public network as we as we defined. Private, I or sorry, public, I believe, is the default um, the default network name for VMB Hive, which is why I kept that naming convention here to uh, link your uh, your interface to the to the NetGraph bridge called public. Um, how do you do with parents? I think it's like this. And I'm going to take my default configuration file. And I think that's pretty much ready to go. So I'm just cloning basically a blank Debian 11, um, uh, what's it called? The no cloud image. That's my, that's my favorite um, because it, uh, it, it works with T both Tmux, or sorry, it works both with console and with uh, UEFI graphics. All right, and if I did everything right, um, I believe that we have uh, two, two working net, net graph nodes that'll work with VM Beehive um, uh, just, by, just by default with those, those, uh, just those couple of commands. Oh no. Well, you know, best laid plans. What did I miss here? Of course, I was able to create, um, you know, uh, sixteen different nodes on this machine with uh, with one command that I that I well prepared. But uh, uh, let's see here. Failed to find virtual switch public. That's a terrible lie. All right, so something in my configuration scripted. Oh, I know exactly what's wrong. So this is something I mentioned many times in my documentation. You have to have the 1.50. When I said that I didn't test this squeaky clean new computer, I was serious about that. Hmm. There we go. That's what I wanted to see. Hmm. Well, maybe I cl maybe this clone didn't uh, didn't come over correctly. That's too bad. We were very very close. Anybody anybody uh, see me make a mistake besides the wrong version of VMB Hive? Nope. Yeah, this looks good. Yeah, we've got a private bridge. And I bet you if we, um, you know, let me print out a map. And we'll take a look at my map. This is one of the wonderful things about uh, NetGraph. Um, oh, I think I need a password.
Yeah, so we link to BG, we link to our, yeah, we have our private network, which we're not using, and we're using, we have our public network that's linked. This is perfect. So VM Beehive should be able to link directly into that. That should be no problem. Um, Hmm, here we go. My vol mode might not be dev. That's interesting. Huh. I cloned the wrong thing. Sorry about that. Don't be. <sighs> I cloned the uh, directory, not the zvol. That's okay. Yeah. All right, and we're linked to the VLAN uh, with with that network. And then to to switch it, it's you know it's just as easy as either editing the configuration file or um, or, or using some of the built-in uh, ng-up commands. All right, oops, and it doesn't like a dash. Yeah, there we go, it does. Oh, yeah, of course, they did RC conf with a dash in it. It's not going to like that. All right, so in this one, we have Um, what did I call the bridge? Another bridge, I think. Hmm. There, now that added that to the VMB Hive configuration. And if you remember before, the, um, the uh, 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 IP address started with a 10. So this time it should start with a 192 because we, uh, linked it to another network this time. And here we go. Um, so now we're on a different uh, now we're on a different network. And of course, on on this machine during my demo, I these two private interfaces, um, you know, this is where you would run your um, you know, th these are assigned, and that's where you would run your DHCP server. So we can actually do some pretty complicated things with NetGraph. Now, of course, this is on Rails. We have we have some assumptions that we're making. We're assuming that uh, that the NetGraph, NetGraph configurations um, all have a you know a routed interface, so they're not just communicating together. So you know, obviously, if you want to do something that complicated, then you want to use ng control manually to have you know, those, those sort of special capabilities. And of course, NetGraph is capable of doing um, a lot more than I've done. Um, but for my purposes, linking jails and uh, you know, client systems and VMs all together in a, in a single private network with you know, one command that generates it, generates some sane defaults in, in you know, two seconds, 
that's definitely what I was looking for here. And I think that uh, along with the um, Beehive version 1.5 could uh, uh, be really useful to a lot of people who are looking to play with NetGraph. Do you happen to have iperf3 on the host and a VM and perhaps a second VM? <laughs> well, these, these, uh, yeah, these, these hosts are, are crappy old Mac minis on a one gigabit link. So okay. I don't know, <laughs> I, I don't know how, how we're going to do there, but I do, I do probably have, um, e pairs on some, some other ones in this network. What? So I can at least compare apples to apples. Um, and taps, I mean taps. You're always comparing apples to apples on Mac Minis, but uh, -dum -dum. sorry, I couldn't resist. Uh, <laughs> the uh, bandwidth between uh, host and guest shouldn't be impacted by your outbound network port. Oh right, yeah, of course. So if I could just compare, I could just do create the same system, though I'm not going to make the 16 node <laughs> system with e pairs and taps, but. Um, well, with the, the pair part of it anyway, but, um, yeah, I could, I could definitely compare those two. I, I did see in the Clara article on the subject and, you know, I heard, um, people report in one of the Beehive meetings that there is some improvement, um, switching from TAP IF bridge to, uh, the net graph. Um, I don't know what everyone else has experienced, but I'll, I'll do some testing for you cool. for sure. And it sounds like Jan, you had other questions. Yeah, yeah um, sorry for the snarky comment in the chat. You're forgiven. Um, the thing is, um, you can also rename ePair and other interfaces uh, without going through NetGraph. So uh, just because, of course, uh, ePair twenty something isn't human readable, and even if you annotate them with descriptions, it gets annoying. And always tracking all the mappings between different namespaces and so on is a very error prone and annoying in scripts. But yeah. uh, oftentimes you can avoid all of this by just embedding namespaces into each other by renaming, for example, interfaces or uh, VMs and so on. If you can constrain your namespaces a bit, that you, uh, embedding them solves most of those problems. Right, though there's double with, uh, you have to deal with the double the number with e pairs. And I just found it, I found it so impossibly messy that when I started using so that graph, why do you I, need I, twice as many e pairs? Because in e pair, because you have to, because, because the e pair on the other side needs to be, of course, the, the, yeah, a, sure. the a side needs to, should be named, cons I mean, you don't have to name it consistently. And, you and, should. But, Exactly right. So, so that that level that level of management, if if it performed better than NetGraph, then I think that there would be no question. It would be it would be certainly worth it, and I I wouldn't have changed uh, anything at all. Um, but uh, the the fact that it works uh, pretty well with uh, with jails as well, and um, you know you don't need the the, well, I guess I guess you assign directly to the bridge if you're if you're running um, a DHCP server on that. So that's that's perfectly fine. But yeah, I used to have a very complicated, not not complicated, but you know, I, I would name everything by client name or by link name or um, everything. And then I still have about half of my servers uh, running like this. So I think the question is honestly, the question is if it performs equally or better, then I think the net graph is a little tidier. And it's a little it's a little easier to um, maintain. And now, of course, uh, it's not easier to maintain because um, let me see. Let's see. Where's my private? Yeah, here we go. So yeah, we need all of these. Are you know the, these commands are insane? The the make peer Why? commands and then. Well, I mean, I understand. It's just I how understand. NetGraph works. You need a node, and then you can address either from a, a global name or relative to a socket, and go from there, hook by hook. I, I won't uh, get in a fight with any NetGraph developers, but the fact that you can't name it on creation is a little nutty. Uh, and I think that's a restriction of the uh, command line interface. Well, sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you're. I'm. I'm sure you're right. 
Uh, so, but I think that I think that encapsulating this and something that that a human being can uh, understand quickly is well. Look, I w I need this tool for sure in order to in order to use NetGraph. I don't think I could do it. Uh, you know, I'm not capable of doing it without. I mean, like this this line, I misspelled three times and I killed a couple of servers. Like, you know, there's there's there are dangers to it because you can also name something. Uh, you know, use an existing name or, or something like that, and you can you can brick a machine. Believe me, I, I did a number oh, of times uh, while testing. Of course, you can brick your system as root. That's kind of a purpose of being root. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, yeah, but no, I, I agree. Once, if if I have if, but I think back to your point. If I have bridge and and e pair outperformed netgraph, then I think that I would stick with it. There would be. There would be no question about that. It's not. It's not so uh, much easier to uh, to do it this way than than the other way. But I do think that there's also some benefits of NetGraph. I do love the you know just sort of sewing links between um, between nodes like this and having mm -hmm. those capabilities in my back pocket um, that are a little uh, that are you know just a, a little more robust than IF Bridge and uh, ePair can can do for you. Of course, none of that matters as much for VM. So, where it really counts for Beehive is um, is performance. Not just performance; it's also how easy it is to add new NetGraph uh, classes. Uh, for example, if you wanted to have uh, special virtual private links between VMs in the same customer project across hosts or something there, you could do something with the software defined back uh, con control plane in NetGraph, which would be really hard to do in uh, otherwise in FreeBSD. Yeah, and you hit the nail on the head for what the motivation for this project was, is I, I can create um, this this basically uh, just, I mean, it just takes a, it just takes a layer of difficulty away from, um, from creating a, what Amazon calls a VPC for a client. We I create, can create a, you know, uh, just very easily manage even between hosts, different, uh, different uh, virtual networks that are, that are linked together and isolated for single clients, which I Is just, there I just, a I love VXLAN it. Uh, NetGraph node type? Uh, I don't. Using? Uh, I I don't. I just use I just use VLANs and then packet filtering. But uh, uh, but you know it's it's a start for sure. I think that if there was a VX if there was a VXLAN uh, netgraph node, that would be extremely interesting. There is a GIF and GIF DMAX, uh, which is an IP and IP tunnel or. Maybe even anything in IP tunnel. Mm -hmm. So if you have enough IP addresses, so that you don't need a packet type to demultiplex on, or maybe the GIF DMAX netgraph hook. Oh, that one does it. It at, at, at least dispatches by protocol, uh, so that you could uh, not really what you need right now. Uh, I don't think you need to treat IPX, ATM, and IP and IPv6 differently. <laughs> I doubt it, but From yeah, me. but I think I think yeah, what you're saying is, I mean, I think that the doors are also open for you know a lot more interesting things we can do with Beehive if we use NetGraph. So, I think I I think this is sort of ironic that I did this uh, project because. Uh, Michael asked me if I was using NetGraph, and I said, "Why would I use something that arcane and confusing? It seems like a total waste of time." And here <laughs> I am with my my own tool that uh, that you know helps me configure my hosts. Uh, so I've, I've actually, yeah, it's it's not bad. Um, so I other... used to uh, use NetGraph for uh, IP and UDP tunneling hacks and so on. Mm -hmm. And in that case, uh, did some nasty things to bypass uh, university networking policies. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> and in the end, it, it worked and performed at line rate, so. 
Michael, is there anything else that uh, you'd, you'd like to see on my screen or uh, are we, you know, we can of course refer people to the, you know, to the code. If... Sure, I, and I hopefully have the right link in the minutes, which was your net draft buddy and a super simple <laughs> clarification. Where does one find the Debian no cloud image? I posted a an image finder dot Debian dot net. And I don't know. If um, it. I wonder if I have it in my history. Okay. Because someone might find that useful. Yeah, absolutely. I definitely like it. No, I don't have it here. Um, I will dig that up and I'll put it in the minutes. The no cloud image, uh, it, it does expect um, cloud in it. Um, so yeah, so some things like SSHD aren't going to work immediately, but it's, but it's really, I, I found it to be really handy and worth the, you know, worth the trouble. Um, so I'll drop a, I'll drop a link in there as soon as I find it. Okay. I've dropped in what might be it, but go ahead and correct that and totally thank you. Uh, so, and you say requires cloud in it. Um, well, it expects it. So SSHD isn't going to automatically configure itself. It. Uh, yeah. So the, the, I mean, that, that it's pretty, you know, pretty minor impediments and it boots with no root password, which I think it is a good thing because if I'm setting up a server sure. in the first place, you know, and that's, that's a good start for me. Got it. Excellent. Excellent. Thank cool. you so much. And any other questions for Daniel? You have uh, taken this by the horns. <laughs> Let's see. Boom. Share. Possibly, I'm sharing that again. Okay. Um, did ahead, you Jan. manage to get iperf free running between no, host I, and guest? I, I wasn't. I wasn't uh, setting that up right now, but I'll I'll do that. Yeah, inquiring minds definitely want to know. <laughs> Uh, the relative performance, but just on that very topic, how would you summarize it? Are you seeing it as a, a specific percentage of just post line rate performance? Right. I, I guess I would, I would guess, I guess I would want to know what exactly I'd be testing for. How would you characterize the performance of a VM networking using your combination of that graph and your tool, et cetera. Right, but uh, I don't know, just like what specific, you know, what specific metrics would I be uh, focusing on in iPerf? Because there's a whole lot of options. I, but I'll just do the, I'll just do the default. The we'll default would be happens. a great start, just smoke test yeah. it. Or a, I suppose you could even run a, a, a jail side by side with a VM and just spit out a number. Um, sure. And sounds whenever good. I think of something like that, equally important to the desired performance is the undesirable performance mm -hmm. and identifying mm -hmm. it early because if it's like crawling, then yeah, address that because it might be something unexpected. Anyway, awesome work, man. Thanks. Um, anything else? That was fantastic. That is it's more than enough topics I personally would also like to pursue and just see getting into more hands. Um, yeah, your quote, your comment about why on earth would I use NetGraph to, oh my gosh, that is cool, is, is paraphrased, of course, is inspiring. <laughs> and you cannot possibly be alone in wanting to, you know, orchestrate this in that way, especially if there are typos that will take down a server, which is not desirable in production environments. Yeah, Are I'd you... like to see bits of bits of this just, you know, pop into, you know, VM Beehive in particular. It'd be really nice to see the names of the VMs in the graph. That's that's a big thing that's missing in my opinion. You said names they... of the VMs in the graph? Yeah. Okay. So the the way, yeah, the way my my tool work is is uh, well, or the way I use it is, I expect the VM, sorry, the jail name to match the the uh, inter, the jail's interface name, and then it makes it super easy to configure. So I see the basically the jail name as the jail interface name in the net graph, but all the VMs are not named unknown. So uh, that would be a that would be a big uh, improvements using NetGraph once we can see the VM names in the graph. 
Sure. Are you in touch with the VM Beehive project? No, but I probably should be. Yeah, I, I suspect they're welcoming. And if you're bringing this much uh, nifty new functionality to the table, they might be uh, rather enthusiastic. OK, small point of order. I will be traveling next week, but same time zone. Uh, it might be easy for me to moderate a meeting. It might not be. I do not know. Jan, you did a great job as a, a guest moderator and note taker. So uh, I don't know. It, it's great to see that uh, Patrick and John have been very interactive this last week, both on IRC and the last call. So uh, I'll try to see exactly where I'll be and make a decision on if I encourage a meeting or simply say, OK, too much is going on and I can't provide much value. So. Any other final ideas, questions, topics, concerns, epiphanies? Well, I wish you all fantastic health in this fall season as people return to indoors. And, <laughs> and uh, if any of you can drop into the uh, OpenZFS Developer Summit next week, I hope to see you there. I just looked up, there is no the XLAN uh, NetGraph utility in FreeBSD 13.1 base at least. Not yet, all right. Not yet. But there is an the XLAN implementation in the normal network stack, so. Got it. I'd Could be you... curious how complex a a the plan is a bit complicated because it is a bit over the generic and uses UDP and so on. Hmm. For a special use case, you could get away with a simpler configuration. Could even be tempting to add no header at all and do it all with uh, the destination IPv6 address because then you could reduce pain points on the underlay network, but still. Uh, Daniel, is IPv6 anywhere in your uh, roadmap and ecosystem? I know Jan is sort of almost, his hand is forced in using it. Yeah, I, I it is definitely on the roadmap. Um, yeah, weirdly, my data centers charge extra for it, which <laughs> okay. is bizarre, like, <laughs> you know, like, you have infinite number of addresses and yet it costs more. Um, so I could find another data center or I can, uh, I mean, it's it's nothing really, but uh, but yeah, I, I, I am planning to implement it after I get things a little bit settled with my fleet. I'm okay. doing some more orchestration first. <laughs> Very cool. Well, if there's nothing else, then I thank you all and wish you a highly productive, healthy week. Yeah, you too. Thanks. Thank Bye. You. Thank you. See you Take all. Care. Bye, everyone.